Hi there, it's Kevin with the Rogue Deck Builder here with the top 10 brew cards from New Phyrexia. These are the cards that I am most excited to brew around. I've done these videos in the past. These aren't the most powerful cards. Let's just get that out of the way. These are my particular favorite designed cards that I think make great brew cards. So I haven't done one of these in a while. I apologize. I'm not going to make excuses with the normal, I've been busy, I've been you know, disenchanted with magic, blah, blah, blah. We're going to get back to doing brews on this channel and there are some good stuff coming out. New Phyrexia was just a slam dunk of a set as far as synergistic cards and value engines, which is something that I really, really love. And this this set just seemed to sit home or, or to, to uh, hit home with me. And I'm very excited to be brewing around M more than just the cards that are in this top 10, but a lot of the cards I think are going to be very good for standard, modern, pioneer, uh, lots of new archetypes being spawned. Uh, this is going to be a set that I think is going to be beloved long term. They've been, had some knock out of the park sets recently, and with all the things going on with Magic, you got to give credit where credit's uh, due to the design team. They've just really done a, 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 well done, a well done job with many of these cards. Still a little bit of salty for cards like Shieldred from you know sets of the past. I think that they need to quit. Uh, doing these kind of one trick pony cards that are just, you know, perfect fits for everything. But this set, I'm seeing a lot of synergy and I'm really, really loving it. Okay, with that mouthful out of the way, let's get to the top 10 cards that start off with an honorable mention because the cat is out of the bag with this one. I'm late to the party with this video. Kemba Condoring, when I saw this card spoiled, I'm like, wow, Hammer Time and Pioneer. You got everything you need for Hammer Time. Whenever Kemba enters the battlefield, or another cat enters the battlefield under your control, you can attach up to one target equipment to that creature. So, of course, some busted equipment that can then have high equip cost but low cast cost can be then attached to a card. And it's just a, a value engine. So, Hammer Time is sort of, it's not quite the same thing like Pioneer, but it's definitely Colossal Hammer, Kemba. It's coming to Pioneer. There's already a deck that did, I believe, win a 5-0 league with it. Uh, so it's it's legit, and this card is really good. The stats on it are good. I'm really liking how design is doing this too. They typically overcost cards like this, and now they've realized, okay, enablers, engines, they need to come out no later than turn three. You need them out turn two. The finishers, those type of stuff are going to be the converted mana cost, you know, four, five, sixes. Let's start putting relevant bodies on these cards so they can actually see play and relevant abilities. And then that's the way they're going to get into the format. So Kemba is going to bring Colossal Hammer and other equipment over into Pioneer and make that kind of a relevant strategy. So we'll give another archetype that people can work with with Kemba Ka Enduring. There are a couple other equip cards in this set that were interesting, but this one I think is, is definitely the, the, the most interesting one. And like I said, it's an honorable mention just because the cat's out of the bag. Someone's already done it. So people have already built the deck. Um, kind of the deck, it, it works with cats. Cats actually like to be equipped, which is actually pretty good. There's some really good one drops, two drops, and you can actually use a companion because all the, the cards in your deck are going to be cats. So you have that kind of staying power with the companion as well. On to our number 10. Number 10 is going to be a card that reminds me of Niv-Mizet uh, that was printed in, what was that, War of the Spark? When was that? It was a while back, but Attracts a Grand Unifier. Um, it's just a value engine that then can get flickered. So Attracts a Grand Unifier is a Flying Vigilant Death with life, Lifelink 7-7 seven, seven for 7 mana. So this is a card that obviously wants to be cheated into play uh, but once it's in play this is just a value engine galore when there's the battlefield that's not a cash trigger which again there's there's pros and, and cons to cash triggers but when attracts enters the battlefield reveal the top 10 cards of your library for each card type you may put card of that type among the reveal cards in your hand so you're at least going to get hopefully an artifact a creature, an enchantment, an instant, a land, a planeswalker, a sorcery. So this is one of those decks that is a toolbox deck. Um, what's kind of cool about this particular uh, card is that you can have cards with multiple types and then you can pick and choose like which one. So it makes like enchantment creatures really good, artifact creatures really good. And then it also did say battle. So it's giving you kind of a, a spoiler. I don't know, have they spoiled that what battle is going to be? I know that's probably going to be a future card type that's going to come in uh, Magic in the next set or, or next year or whatever they do, the, the major changes that they're doing for Magic the Gathering. I think that's going to be one of them. But this is just a, a, a Brewer synergistic card. Um, in Pioneer, I think the, the Enigmatic Incarnation 
works pretty good with this because you're already utilizing enchantments, you're already using creatures, you can splash in some planeswalkers and whatnot, and then Atraxa just becomes such a great value engine that you can grind out games. Any uh, sort of deck that cheats this card into play, it's just a lot, it's a lot on one body. I mean, the 7-7 seven, seven Flying Vigilance Death Touch Lifelink is good on its own, and then the at least drawing a few cards. I mean, ten, ten top 10 cards you're going to find you know, three, four at least, I would say, with land, creature, artifact, if, if you're building a deck uh, based around those type of, of strategies. So I think Atraxa is a great synergistic card. And that's, it's kind of my, my uh, high up on my top 10 list because, you know, it's just kind of a duck card. It's going to, these, these, it's very synergistic, but it's not something that's going to like spawn a new archetype or really use a lot of creativity of when building a deck. Alrighty, so on to my number nine. My number nine is going to be the Encroaching Mycosynth. Now, I haven't figured out a way to utilize this card in like Standard or Pioneer at the moment, or even Modern, but this is just a quicker way to get out the, the uh, Mycosynth Lattice type card. It doesn't affect your opponent's cards though, so it's just a, a it's not mirrored, it's just yours. So non then permits you control or artifacts in addition to other types. So you have a lot of cards in Pioneer that will say, like, play the top card of your library if it's an artifact. Um, so, I mean, it's not get the land but any other creatures then will be artifacts and they're at that point you can start to do some really bonkers stuff with these type of cards so whenever cards printed like this it's always going to be something that i'm going to try to break um you got to think of all the cards that reduce artifacts we've we've had so many artifact sets in a row we had brothers war we had even dominaria had a huge artifact new capenna surprisingly had a lot of artifacts in it and then of course kamigawa was an artifact set and so we've had a lot of our artifact sets in, a, sets in a row with a lot of these cantrippy type artifacts um, and then allowing everything to reduce the cost of artifacts and then being artifacts or working off artifacts. Think of power stones so that it can add mana towards artifacts. You kind of get the gist of where this is going, that this can kind of be the engine that can really make those type of decks um, good. At that point too, like planeswalkers become artifacts and there's, 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 there's got to be some bonkers stuff that you can do with encroaching a mycosynth. Uh, to make this card broken. I even thought even like other shells with like tribal based decks, like turning elves into artifacts and then you can untap target, uh, no, untap all artifacts. Those kind of things are kind of crazy. These, this, this type of card opens up a lot of avenues to brewing. And it's, it's one of those cards that's not, I mean, it's not, not like a tracks. It's the opposite of a tracks. It's very narrow on what it wants to be doing with like, okay, we're going to try to, to uh, find the best value possible by uh, making things artifacts inside of our deck. So again, lots of things that work off artifacts in the past few sets. Alrighty, so on it to our number eight. Number eight is going to be the Mirren Safe House. This is another one that I am not quite sure how to make this work. I can see Legacy making this card work. I can see definitely Commander. And that's where I'm really focusing on this because there are a lot of crazy combos uh, like there are lands that untap themselves, and then of course lands like the like those Shrine of Nyx or or, or uh, the 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 Cabal Coffers, those type of things that can add tons of mana. So the Mirror and Save Us then can be an infinite mana type card if those cards are in your graveyard. And I'm thinking that e even in Modern and Pioneer, we're going to start to see some some pretty crazy activated abilities uh, that can work with the the Safe House. So um, you know things that untap. I mean things that there's got to be some ways. That this this card can actually have some you know card combos with your graveyard. Those graveyard of, is my favorite zone in Magic, and filling up the graveyard and then having cards have value, and then really having to think how to make these work. This Mirren Safe House definitely is a card that I think is brew worthy, and it'll be interesting to where this card will lead me. Again, not quite sure this one's going to be a knock out of the park if I can find a solution for it, but it's definitely definitely a very creative card, and I love when these type of cards are printed. On it to my number seven. Number seven is going to be Vran Executioner Thane. So, got a couple of ideas for this bad boy. Um, the red, white, or red, red, black Rakdos Sacrifice in standard is almost there. It's just, it's just missing a little bit of oomph. And there are a lot of cards from Crimson Vow that synergize with this with your decay tokens. Uh, with this only triggers once per turn. So it's not quite a blood artist, but at least it triggers double the blood artist. So it's almost like getting two activations out of like a Zulport Cutthroat or a blood artist. Uh, so whenever one or more cre other creatures you control die, each opponent loses two life and you gain two life. This ability triggers only once per turn. It's kind of aggressive too. I could actually see this in like a black aggro shell because if they take care of Ran, you're, they're taking two damage. And this, black aggro gets a lot better with both 
you got flexion, fraction obliterator that could be run, and you also get the persecutor, the new abyssal persecutor wannabe, the six six flying trample for four mana uh, with oil counters uh, that is very aggressive. But then this is another card that then. Um, can work as a two drop, very aggressive two drop, and at least you're going to get some life drain out of it. And but what I like about this one is like in the Rakdos sh sacrifice shell, where you're sacrificing artifacts to create artifacts that can uh, that usually happens on your turn, but then you can kill them on opponent's turns as well. And that's another way to drain three life at that point. And I, there's just some some sort of oomph that's needed to push that deck uh, into playability. And even in the Racto Sacrifice strategy in... By, mind you, I was looking up some stats for Racto Sacrifice. It might be like one of the decks that's underneath the radar for Pioneer. It's got one of the better win percentages against the whole. It's got some very bad matchups, but definitely has some very good matchups. It does very good against like the creature aggro mid-range strategy that a lot of these decks are starting to go towards in uh in, in pioneer but anyway i think ran actually is a one of is pretty decent just to chuck it in i don't know if you want multiple copies other than they do work off each other if nothing else if you have two ran in your hand you cast it you have to choose one of them one of them dies you get the two life so it's, it's not like a dead card i kind of like these legendaries that have these sort of etb trigger effects that can happen uh by having multiples in your hand so you don't get stuck with these like legendary creatures but it, this card i think it just does everything you want it to do it only says triggers once each turn it doesn't have to be your turn so you can do it on your opponent's turn with any sort of sack outlet so sacks on your turn sack on your opponent's turn you're getting a four point swing on each turn it's two drop exactly where you want it to be you don't want it to be three is so awkward with these type of decks you want it to come out on turn number two uh, or turn number one for these type of like i said the engine cards um and so this fits that bill and it's it's hopefully it'll be enough uh, to push that sort of archetype into standard and you know maybe even uh, work for some some pioneer decks at that point vampire too that's relevant vampires are relevant tribe and it's something i think will uh hopefully i can make a, a decent deck out of this card on to my number six my number six is going to be nahiri the unforgiving now this one i think is underrated i think people are really looking at this like oh it, it dies the reanimation dies you can get this sucker out on turn number three and if it was followed up by cards that have died or, I mean, the problem is it doesn't, you don't get to sacrifice in the beginning of next end step uh, with the token. So I'm looking at the zero build here. The other ones are kind of not that relevant. You can force something, you can goad something, uh, you can discard a card, then draw a card, which is okay. It's not bad, especially if, when it comes out on turn number three. But what I'm liking to hear is it's giving flexibility that if you need it to come out on turn number four and have a more variety of things you can reanimate, that, but at that point you can reanimate some three drop stuff with any sort of enter the battlefield type effects. Um, or if you need it to come out on, on turn number three, uh, some two drops that have died, um, there's still connive in the, the, the format. There's still things like Bitter Reunion, uh, Fable the Mirror Breaker that can fill up your graveyard in these color shells. And then you can get a lot of value out of those type of cards. It doesn't come back to as a blocker unless there's some sort of ETB effect that, have, that makes a blocker. But again, this is just a value engine that comes out on time that I think is a little bit underrated for what this uh, ability does. Um, a lot of people are thinking uh, one-dimensionally as far as Planeswalkers are concerned with, well, and uh, maybe Wizards actually <laughs> watched one of my rant videos that I did on it all. I did a video called All Planeswalkers or Gideons where Planeswalkers just became so boring. It was like draw a card, create a token, remove something. Whereas this set does look like a lot of the Planeswalkers shied away from that or, or, or having these big ults. Uh, to where now they're they're having some sort of value engine towards them and a lot of synergy. And Nahiri fits that bill with excellent creature or equipment card from your graveyard. It comes back as a, a copy of that, and then you it, you get value. So every turn you can get value out of filling up your graveyard and utilizing those creatures. So again, it's going to be kind of awkward where this would fit in. It would need some particularly high-powered cards. They wanted to have haste. I even thought at this point um, the there are some very, very aggressive cards uh, that I could see this one working at. So there's a shell now in Pioneer that, that's using Storm Herald. I don't know if you want to go with Naya at that point, but Naya is definitely an option. You can go with Storm Storm Herald. They wants to fill up your graveyard with as many cards as possible. And then if you accidentally put your Storm Herald in the graveyard, this is another way that can get it back into the, the battlefield. And giving just some, some creatures haste is huge. If they have any sort of uh, deal damage effect or like i said enter the battlefield effect 
that is uh, pretty good with, uh, well, of course, attack attack triggers, dealing damage triggers, those are what Haste wants. And Nahiri, the Unforgiving, I think is, is, is pretty good for meeting the requirements for what those type of cards want. Um, and, it, it, you know, really, and it's a renewable resource every turn using it over and over again. So I'm really liking this card. This one's going to be a bit difficult to see where it would work because protecting the Planeswalker and making sure that it gets value is going to be rough. And this is another card too. It's like the loyalty can keep keep ticking up with like the plus one. But at that point, like what are you going to do with it? I get, you can start reanimating things bigger and bigger. But if you're building a deck around kind of low to the ground cards, the plus one is kind of not that relevant. Kind of wish this would have had one more ability. So they would have slapped on like some sort of, you know, ultimate effect if it got up to seven or eight. I think that'd be, be kind of neat. Anyway, we'll go on to, to the next card on to our number five is going to be the Charforger. Now, this card was my number one at, at, at one point, and I kept kind of moving it down because it was harder and harder for me to, to figure out how to make this work. Treasure Tokens, I think, is uh, really, really powerful with this. Um, treasure Tokens are just nuts. There are so many cards that have this uh, kind of effect. This is the one that kind of chose for it. There's one other on my, my list you'll see in a moment here. So whenever another creature or artifact you control is put into the graveyard, you put an oil counter on it, and then you can remove three oil counters, exile top card li library, you can play it. So it's kind of a draw engine. Again, I, I started to just think about this one that it might just be too weak as a 2-3. It, it creates a 1-1. One, one. But in that sacrifice, that said sacrifice shell, this is another value engine that you can eventually get this out. Three things just have to go to the graveyard. Um, if it's treasure tokens, uh, if you're like creating treasure tokens or adding mana and putting oil counters on this the mana can then be used towards casting whatever is off the top card library it's just a grindy kind of fun design card not again not sure it's playable or not but it's not going to stop me from trying to make this this type of card work almost wish this would have had well you get the one one so you're getting a three four for basically three mana three 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 power four toughness worth of it and again the and, and to be, uh, battlefield trigger is kind of neat with it i don't i really like this card for that type of sacrifice shell as a draw engine interesting card really like the design of it and i will be trying my hardest to break this card on to my number four number four is the venerated rot priest this absolutely was my number one but then i see everyone else and their dog is trying to actually make this card work this card's bonkers so in standard i think this can go in two different shells one is going to be a green blue shell which just wants to get a venerated rot priest out and there are a few other cards you could run at that point you have an aggressive four four for three you've got a couple of you know one three toxins for like two mana that are pretty good uh but then there are many spells like there's a balance spell there's a, a draw spell that creates a, a poison counter there's a anticipate that prolifer proliferates and then giving this card hex proof or uh, your creature, your opponent tries to target it. You respond with like a indestructible card or or that said bounce card that also proliferates or gives a poison counter. Then your opponent has two poison counters already on them. They haven't really answered a threat. You have two of these out. They stack off each other. Um, there are a few copy spells in the format. Like there's a blue copy spell that is is pretty good with enter rot priest. So what I like about this is it's it's mirrored. It's been a while since they've been printing these type of mirrored cards. Typically it's either when you target it or your opponent targets it. This is whenever a creature you control becomes a target uh, of a spell. Target opponent gets a poison counter. So you can target it, your opponent can target it, and that just really makes it so when you're holding up spells that actually protect it, that is huge, where your opponent is getting two poison counters. And then he followed up with some really, really efficient proliferate cards right now in the format with the negative four, negative four, and a proliferate. There's sacrifice a creature proliferate. So like I said, the green black shell looks really, really neat uh, with this rot priest. The blue green shell looks really, really good too. Um, and it's just, it just seems to be like just a bonkers card for what it does. Um, big, huge swings in, and there's no way to get rid of poison counters once they have it. And so this one's going to be fun to tune. This is more of like a tuning card, not really a brewing card because it's obvious what you want to be doing with this. It's just to be, uh, the whole process is going to be finding what cards are going to make this card the most efficient. And I think that's going to be a fun little experiment for the rock priest. And then we, I haven't even talked about modern and pioneer, how well this card could actually go in those type of shells. Cause you get access to a ton of of powerful um, kind of Drago effects or tempo-based effects that could actually make Veteran Raw Priest even, even more powerful um, in the 60. So anyway, I really like this card. It is just bonkers good, and it's not going to stop me. Like, I, I used to have, like, kind of a... I don't pick powerful cards for these, but 
eh, I think this one's fine to pick as a powerful card and it's just got enough synergy and enough of, of, uh, of options that actually makes it kind of, kind of neat to, to, to brew around. On to my number three. Number three is going to be the Cothfire of Resistance. So this is just nostalgia. So one of the more popular series that I did or decks that I played around with in modern uh, was Scred, uh, with Koth being kind of the the iconic centerpiece of Scred Red because uh, it was just such a value engine. Now, this guy isn't nearly as good as the old school Scred, but it still does have very similar abilities. So the plus two is you just get a basic mountain. So it's going to allow you to have some sort of value. You can start utilizing that too um, as loot, like the, what do they call it? Rummaging effect. So discard a card, draw a card. If you have other things like thrill possibilities in your deck or any other cards that can, like that Nahiri I said before, the finding a basic mountain to pitch is actually fine if you're hitting your land drops but what, where this one is really good is if you can get it up to its negative seven every time a mountain enters the battlefield deals four damage to target that's your finisher that's your control so this cough actually does everything you want it to do it's going to come down in a mono red deck and hopefully do you know you can kill a creature you can do four damage to a creature keep back a your planeswalker start ticking it up with your plus twos maybe utilize it again so if nothing else cough will oftentimes that's how it was in scred your first few coughs were just removal and then your your later on costs were going to be the ones you're going to eventually value out your opponent and get up to the emblem and then their emblem's going to finish off the game so exactly this is what's going to happen with this one uh, i got a friend that's already messed around with this sucker in in pioneer and says it's just absolutely bonkers in a scred type shell with chandra and cough as kind of the centerpiece of their four drop planeswalkers that are going to get you a lot of value and then you just run so much control at that point that you know the emblems of either of those are are, are are going to be your engines that get you there i really like playing this archetype um it's fun to play um, oftentimes it can sneak into a meta and be very, very good because it can be insanely good versus like aggro and control. That's what I loved about Scred is it did very good in its aggro, mid range and control. It suffered from combo, but you can always tailor your sideboard for that. And I'm thinking it's going to have a very similar, uh, type of meta structure in, uh, Pioneer being probably really good against the, the Rakdos mid range decks or the Gruul aggro decks or the mono red decks. And then it, very good against control as well, because you can, you can get a lot of value out of your planeswalkers. So very, very, uh, excited to brew around cough. I think it brings that scred sort of archetype to pioneer. Now with Chandra and cough, you can go that, like that, that what we call big red or uh, not really big red because big reds throwing a lot of mid range creatures out, but kind of having the planes, planeswalker centric cards that then fall with a lot of, you know, removal and control, uh, in a mono red type shell. Alrighty. So that brings us on to our number two. Number two is going to be the vat of rebirth. Okay. Hear me out. This card is underrated. I am just obsessed with this card. At, when I saw this card, I opened up in a pack and was looking at it and I just kind of, eh, it's too hard to make it work. And then I remember treasure tokens and blood tokens. Blood tokens and treasure. Well, blood tokens with this this sucker especially because you're doing the two for one. You're putting the card you want in the graveyard and you're putting an oil. Now, it, you have to get it to four oil counters and it's three and tap. So peop, other people are like, well, why don't you just run a reanimation spell? Because I don't quite think that that of rebirth is a reanimator uh, deck card. There are better things for that. Where I think that that of rebirth is, is it is a value engine reanimator. The, the, like we used to have a, the rock when the green black archetype, it was more than just Golgari. The rock was specific. Uh, one of the very first decks that I played competitively was an oversold cemetery card that our cemetery deck. Oversold cemetery was an enchantment that wanted creatures in your graveyard. And then you just got one back from your graveyard, to your hand every turn, not even back on the battlefield. And it was just the, it was a the rock decks. Golgari were very grindy. So you want to control the, your opponent from, you know, doing stuff. You want to have a lot of creatures with ETB effects. Uh, you get a Glissa out of this one that I think Glissa is perfect for something like this sort of shell, because it's got a lot of modes of drawing and destroying. And you have a lot of other ETB type effect cards. Um, aforementioned card before with the, the draining every time something, uh, you know, goes to the graveyard. Um, this just works perfectly though with blood tokens and treasure tokens, getting those oil counters on the battery birth and having this just be a renewable resource to re continue to return creature cards, not to your hand, but right to the battlefield. So then things that maybe add tokens or tre like treasure tokens or blood tokens or whatever, they become a lot more stronger too, because you're going to be putting more oil counters on. And this can just be a very grindy image. You can slap it down, turn one and forget about it till it's ready to go. And I, I'm really, really loving this card with a lot of options. Is it going to be too slow? Probably. 
but it's not going to stop me from trying to brew around it. It's unfortunately there's a lot of just things have been slapped on destroying artifacts that make this a little bit more of a risk. But um, what's kind of cool about this deck too is you have you have a a, a kind of really looping. I'll have to show you a Jun deck that I run around with this, uh, or even you can go just green, green black at this point. But you have the the instant. They can also uh, return an artifact in a uh, creature back from your graveyard uh, to your hand or permanent in a creature if you kick it. And then if you have a creature that gets back a sorcery or an instant, then you can kind of cycle it over and over and over. And so that's kind of where I've been trying these type of decks that I think are are really fun to play. That's these toolbox type of grindy decks. They've always been a favorite of mine. These 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 what we call the rock shells. Um, very, very fun. Anyway, on it to my number one. So what could beat out all of these cards? Well, there is one card that I'm obsessed with more than anything else because I think it really breeds life into an archetype, into Pioneer, and that is Tavar. Tavar Jubilant Brawler, this is what Elf Ball needs. I am going to be trying to break Tavar in uh, Pioneer. And the thing is Pioneer Elf Ball, or really, well, it's not really an Elf Ball. It's just like a, a really quick, yeah, it's kind of an Elf Ball strategy. And Pioneer has already gotten good out of off of Brothers War. You got another Lord. We also has an attached draw engine. And so it really has everything you need. Well, Tavar can go a different route. You don't have to be running Collective Company. You don't have to be running um, even cards like Lead the Stampede. I don't know. What is the other card they run? Uh, Court of Calling. I think you still would want to run Court of Calling. Uh, but you can, you can run Tavar as your... Um, not really a draw engine. So how this card's going to work, so you can activate abilities of creatures as though they those creatures had haste. So all of your, you're going to be running way more mana dorks, and then you can run some of the bigger mana dorks, like the, the one that adds for every creature, so the guy's cradle creature. Um, and then you can utilize that mana on other things that at that point that uh, there are a few elves that can just flat out draw cards. Or if you have things like Beast Whisperer, I know the Pioneer decks don't run Beast Whisperer. You can actually run that card, and then every card you cast at that point will draw you cards. And then you'll have an actual relevant outlet for your creatures that are being cast, and you'll have the mana to then activate off the new Lord and off, off of Beast Beast. It'll all work in tandem with each other because your mana dorks will be able to replace themselves by you know generating mana. And... Um, the plus one on tapping a creature is very relevant when you you get there are a couple like the canopy that the adds uh, the canopy that the elf adds for every uh, creature control or there's also um, I'm thinking of the one that every time you you cast an elf it gets a plus one counter like those are going to get out of control with mana and then you can utilize that mana to find stuff so I'm thinking like instead of going quarter calling you go more into like uh, or instead of uh, collecting company going more of like finale uh, devastation there are like I got a whole list I was I spent hours this morning as I pop up my list of like possible cards that could go with Tavar and the list is actually it's it's quite it, it's pretty good like there's a lot of things that I think this breathes a lot of life into uh, where like Matt the problem with else right now is like the the mana becomes a little bit of an issue you can kind of get you they need to untap before they can start tapping so your mana dorks have to wait a turn before they can do anything well now they don't with tavar and i know that they could have gone rid of the wild before or other things that gave them haste but tavar is just better because it's never dead under any situation the milling three cards and returning a creature is fine the untapping a creature is fine all of those are like relevant abilities for elf ball and then there's this beautiful card called crypt with right which allows all of your creatures the ability to tap for mana. And so all of the like the Elvish Warmasters or the Dueling's Elite that that pump out elf tokens can now actually be mana dorks. And you literally have elf ball at that point. If you have a draw engine like Beast Whisperer or the New Lord out of uh, Brothers War, or something like even Vanquisher's Banner, or uh, you could even at this point when mana is not an issue, you can run thing like the Great Henge. All of those, you literally can draw your entire deck out at that point. And so instead of like going for let's try to go wide as quick as possible and go the uh, 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 a the the shaman to finish off the game, you can basically not even worry about that and just um, I mean you still probably would want a shaman as a finisher, but you could you could you could just go the route of then giving all your creatures haste and then tacking in with lethal trample and you know from finale of devastation or other cards that can give trample and then just win the game like that. I even thought about like like having a finisher on Ronus's. Uh, uh, the, the the monument that just you know gives plus two plus two every time something comes into play. There are a lot of things, or even using a, a sorcery finisher. But you typically you'd want a creature as a finisher because it works the best you know synergy with that. So I'm really really liking this Tavar for the Elf Ball strategy in Pioneer. Um, I think it's it's super super strong. Unfortunately, Tavar 
from Kalheim taps for black mana. So it's not like a Crypt of Right that it quite gives you. But I mean, there you know, I'll, I'll be, I'm sure I'll be messing around with this deck more than any of them because it's just really got those brewers juices juicing running. And I typically when I get obsessed with a card like this, then I, I don't stop until I break it. So it's pretty, I don't know. This For whatever reason, this set's really gotten me back into magic. Maybe it's just I've taken enough of a hiatus of where, you know, I've had enough time just to give myself a break from magic rethink you know it's still the best game it's still super super fun been frustrated with a lot of things lately like back during the Amonkhet days i was super frustrated back during the um throne of eldraine days i definitely was frustrated but you know it's still so fun there's still so much synergy i think the main reason i've been playing a lot of other card games and board games and then all roads always lead back to magic because it's it's a fun game it's just really well done and despite all of the stuff going on i think it's here to stay uh, sales are great with this latest few sets. Like I said, the design team has knocked out of the park with many of these sets. I don't necessarily care for the power creep, but at least the power creep is in a better way. It's still, the power creep is still playing magic. Whereas like Throne of Eldrain, that design, the entire design, Throne of Eldrain, Ikoria, Theros was just like, they wanted to experiment too much. And a lot of times the experiment, experimentation is just made to not playing magic. You played this like pseudo side game magic where, you know, you had all these I win buttons and whoever, you know, got their I win button won. And at least in this one, you know, shoulders annoying. There are a lot of these annoying overpowered word salad cards, but they're not nearly as like backbreaking to the spirit of the game that cards from the, you know, the throne of Eldraine, the fires of invention type cards, those type of cards were just warping. So wilderness reclamation, those things. So anyway, hope you enjoyed this video. These are my top 10 cards to brew from Phyrexia. I'll be one. Typically I try to get this out before the set is released. So I can start like brewing with these cards. I'm late to the party. I apologize for that, but I'm interested in seeing your list or your comments in the comment section below of what you would brew around and be looking forward to these videos. Hold me accountable for this too. I do want to at least try to start giving you like daily brews or weekly brews of stuff. I have some um, uh, some updates for this channel I want to do to to move a lot of the kind of the the fluff content over to some of the other channels that I do. Some like Market Monday over to the Market Channel and maybe some probably keep the rant videos here because they have a lot of times have to do with uh, the game game state and whatnot. But I want to get focused back on you know more brewing of the the cards and I think this is this is going to be a good set to to re catapult uh, me back into those 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 glory years of of trying to really have fun brewing magic with the other cards anyway hope you enjoyed this video this has been kevin with the rogue deck builder thanks for watching